welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest here in Austin, Texas, and I've had the gift of recovery since December the 27th of 1972. We're going to cut right to the chase here. We're doing a series on uh, a book. The title is A Testament of Devotion, and the author is Thomas R. Kelly. We are now into our fourth episode of this series. As I mentioned last time, I thought it was going to go quicker. And uh, as I read the material again, it's like, well, we can't skip this one, can't skip that one. So it's going to go on a little bit longer than I had planned, but uh, it seems to be the way things go in life, doesn't it? Just to fill in, uh, Kelly was a, a mystic, a Quaker, and a professor. He comes at the material that we're looking at in almost all of these series is, is how do you work the 12 steps more effectively? I mean, that, that's kind of what I'm about in, uh, in this, uh, this work. And uh, he comes at it differently, and, and I think there's a lot to be gained. He's talking in, in this episode, as w- with the last one, about obedience, turning our will and our lives over to the care of God. Uh, seeking God's will and the power to carry that out, steps three and 11. But he's kind of coming at it from uh, the step six and seven perspective of it needs to be total. Uh, You know, half measures availed us nothing. Uh, That's Kelly's perspective. And um, it's kind of a wake-up call for us if we're doing uh, our program by half measures. So We're going to pick up there. His ideas are revolutionary and not simply reforming, you know, not not cleaning things up around the edges, but a a real 180 degree turn of the soul that uh, really changes things dramatically. So that, that's what he is about. So we're, we're going to pick up there. Obedience is key to this because you're either doing it or you're not. You're either, uh, you know, God is everything or he's nothing. I mean, that's, that's where he's coming from. And that's where the big book comes from uh, so often. You know, they sent it, I think, to a, some psychologists and some people uh, when, when after they have re- first wrote the manuscript and, and they got the feedback, well, tone this down. You're going to scare people away. And, and there's some truth to that. But the other side of that, if you're work in a toned down, minimal kind of program, A, you may not stay sober, or B, you ain't going to be happy, you know? So um, it's it's a mixture. You read the big book, it's a mixture, you know? We stood at the turning point, access, protection, and care with complete abandon. Well, here's some suggested steps, you know? (laughs) It's that that yin and yang back and forth. So uh, Kelly tries to cut through that. Going to do a fair amount of reading, so, so bear with me on this. He says, This is something wholly different from mild conventional religion or spirituality, which anxiously tries to fish the world out of the mud hole of its own selfishness. Our churches are full of such respectable and amiable people, as are our 12 step meetings, eh? We have plenty of Quakers to follow God the first half of the way. Many of us have become as mildly and conventionally religious as were the church folk of three centuries ago, against whose mildness and mediocrity and passionlessness George Fox, the founder of the Quakers, and his followers flung themselves with all the passion of a glorious and a new discovery and with all the energy of dedicated lives. If you're a part of an organization and that organization has lost its way, it's gotten fat and lazy and uh, non-productive, the energy, the juice is gone, go back to the originators. Go back to the early days and see what was the, 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 the gift, the key, the charism that that organization had that made it come alive. You go back to their founders. You go back to Jesus. You go back to Dr. Bob. You go back to, uh, you know, any organization, St. Francis for the Franciscans. Go back to any organization, spiritual organization, and see where it came from. 
because it's so easy to lose your way. That's what he's talking about. In sum, says William James, religion exists as a dull habit, in others as an acute fever. Religion as a dull habit is not that for which Christ lived and died. You say the exact same thing about uh, Pioneer AA. What was it about it that was on fire? And, and did the fire go out? Has it become institutionalized? That's, that's what he's looking for here. There is a degree of holy and complete obedience and of joyful self-renunciation and of sensitive listening that is breathtaking. I'm going to read that again. There is a degree of holy and complete obedience. When, when, when my intent is all about doing God's will as I perceive it, a complete joyful self-renunciation. All right, self-renunciation. What, what does the book say? The problem is self. The problem is we're locked into self. And that self is separated from the divine, it's separated from other people. It is not my true self. It's my ego self, my egotistical self, my inflated uh, false self. It goes by different names. But if you get trapped in there, I mean, the big book is absolutely right. The problem is self. And, and I'm coming from the wrong self. There's another self inside of each one of us, a divine center the great reality within uh, go, goes by different names, but once you're there, you know it, and it's very different from your normal kinds of consciousness. It's entering that fourth dimension of existence. Again, going back to big book language. Listen to that. It's a sensitive listening. That's what two-way prayer is. Listening sensitively to what your soul is asking of you, what life is asking of you, what God is driving you toward. you got to listen sensitively to that, perceptively. Difference of degree passes over into difference of kind when one tries to follow God the second half, the second half, the full you know, fully committing ourselves to this simple program. Jesus put it pointedly when he said, you must be born again. Exact same language that the big book uses. Hey, we were, we were reborn. It's like a different self has been accessed, and I'm coming from that, that different place. Okay. All right. I'm going to skip a few pages, and I'm going to tackle now... Uh, the second section of his chapter on obedience, and he titles this one Gateways into Holy Obedience. And when you think of holy, uh, you know, if, if that word scares you, put a W on it. Holy obedience. Whole obedience. Not the half measures kind. Go in that second part of the way. All right, I'm going to read this. So gateways, how do you get in there? What's, what's the entryway to this thing? That's what he's going to be discussing. In considering one gateway into this life of, of holy obedience, let us dare to venture together into the inner sanctuary of the soul where God meets man in awful immediacy. When the veil is taken away, when you have an encounter with the divine. He's going to be speaking about the kind of event that happened to Bill Wilson, you know, a, a, a spiritual experience rather than an awakening, all right? We'll, we'll get into the awakening part later, but here he's talking about a vital spiritual experience. There is an indelicacy in too ready speech saying, be careful about talking about this. Uh, don't rush into it. It's hard to talk about. It's actually impossible to talk about. But, but you're gonna just, it's possible to, to do your best to describe it. And it's going to fall short. Paul felt it unlawful to speak of the things of the third heaven. 
but there is also a false reticence, as if these things were one's own work and one's own possession, about which we should modestly keep quiet, whereas they are wholly God's amazing work, and we are nothing, mere passive receivers. If you have an experience like this, that kind of knocks your ego down for a while, okay? And something else totally different pops up on the screen of consciousness. That's what happened to Bill Wilson. He said, you know, God, if there is a God, help me. And boom, he had this white light, hot flash experience. He felt like he was in the presence of God. The barriers had been removed. And, and he was at peace. And he knew that from that moment on, his alcohol problem had ended. These events are, you know, and then he goes to his, his psychiatry. He says, what the hell's happening to me, doc? Am I going crazy? Is, is that what happened? And what did the doctor say? He said, well, no, you know, I've heard of these things, Bill. Uh, haven't had one myself, but I've heard of them. And, and, and maybe what happened to you is one of these, where, where, where the curtain, the, the separation is withdrawn and a, and a flooding light comes in. And there's all, almost always a bright light uh, kind of uh, surrounding this. And it's illumination, but it's hard to talk about. Now, w one of the things I thought about, what he's saying here is uh, these things are often kept private. We don't talk about them. They're, they're difficult to talk about, so we pass over them. And he's saying, don't be so quick to do that, you know? People are looking for this kind of thing. And if it happened to you, talk about it. And even if it happened in the milder form, talk about it. What came to my mind was, uh, you know, when, when we're given a, a talk in our 12-step fellowships, we're asked to do what? Tell what it was like, tell what happened, and what it's like now. And what do we wind up doing? In, in so many cases, we talk about what it was like. And a drunkologue, if you've got an hour to speak, a drunkologue goes on for 55 minutes. And then, and then someone says, and then I came, came to AA or I came to OA or CA or whatever the hell it was, you know, and it's just been wonderful ever, ever since then. Thank you, guys. You know, off we go. Didn't talk about anything. Didn't talk about the change. And that's what people need to hear. What happened? What happened to you? What was it like? Before, give me enough of that so that I know that I'm talking to somebody who knows my world, but something happened. What happened? Try to describe that as best you can. You know, uh, it, it, it may feel awkward. It may feel difficult. You may struggle. You may cry. You, you may not know what exactly it was. That's okay. <laughs> We, those of us who are listening will appreciate and understand, and, and we need to hear that from more people. So, and that's what he's talking about here, that these things are really gifts. Uh, don't be so humble about it, you know, because it's kind of a false humility. You're thinking you did it. You didn't do it. It happened to you. Do the best you can to uh, to describe it. So this, this is his... Uh, Description of it here, he says, uh, some men come into holy obedience through the gateway of profound mystical experience. Let's read about that. It is an overwhelming experience to fall into the hands of the living God, to be invaded to the depths of one's being by his presence, to be without warning, wholly uprooted, from all earthborn securities and assurances, and to be blown by a tempest of unbelievable power, which leaves one's old, profound self utterly, utterly defenseless. You get blown away. <laughs> I mean, that's what happened to Wilson, you know. Uh, mine, mine. I, I did have one. Uh, it, it was, it was not a, a blinding white light. Uh, for me, it was a voice that came to me, and we're going back, what, 52 years now. Uh, that's, and I was getting ready to run. I was a big runner in my uh, drinking and drug usage. You know, when things got hot, I got the hell out of Dodge. 
And the voice basically said, you know, if, if those are the choices where you're thinking of going, there's something wrong with you. And it was profound in that uh, my ego collapsed at that moment. If there's something wrong with me, if I go to this place, I'll still be wrong. If I go to that place, I'll still be wrong. You know, and I didn't know who the hell I was. Uh, and, and I had been in AA, but I had relapsed and I was drinking again. And uh, I knew I had to go back. And I went back humbly. Uh, my ego got, I'm not going to say destroyed, because I don't think it does get totally destroyed, but it gets suspended. Uh, the ego that's operating in our minds gets suspended for a time. You know, what, an hour, a few days, uh, something like that. Uh, but it's going to creep back. Trust me, it will reconfigure itself, you know, much like the Terminator, like Mercury. You spread it out on the table and it starts coming back together. This is the soul swept into a loving center of ineffable sweetness where calm and unspeakable peace and ravishing joy steal over one. Oh, this he's describing it saying it's like the center of a hurricane. It's a peaceful place within all of the turmoil that you've just been experiencing. The turmoil doesn't go away. I mean, the turmoil is still spinning around you. But in this place, in this center, and that's what he taught, we talked about in, in some of the earlier episodes here. He's describing a center, a place from which one can come, from which one can live, from which one can draw one's energy. That's the great reality within. And, and, and what he's saying and what the book is saying is exactly the same thing. We've got to access that fourth dimension of existence get to know it. We do that through two-way prayer and through the steps, you know, and then we bring it out into the world. All right, going to go on. And one knows why Pascal wrote, in the center of his greatest moment, his greatest trial, the single word, fire. You want, you want a description of what it's like to be in the presence of this center? It is peaceful, but it is powerful. It is on fire. And when you meet someone who's coming from that place, that's the description they'll often give of them. You know, that, that they're on fire. And you go back to the early days of AA, you know, uh, the, when the pioneers were, were, were going at it, they were on fire. Why were they on fire? Because they were in touch with the fire within you know, and if you go to a meeting and it's just boring and everybody sits around, well, what went wrong with you this week? You know, <laughs> ain't much fire there. Ain't much fire. There stands the world of struggling, sinful, earth-blinded men and nations, of plants and animals and wheeling stars of heaven, all new, all lapped in the tender, persuading love at the center. I was talking to somebody the other day who was talking about in their two-way prayer, it was like client, she said, it was a woman, climbing up into the lap, into God's lap, a safe place. Lots of problems swirling around in her life, but in her two-way prayer, she could go to a safe place, God's lap. Right, where she was protected and safe. He's saying the exact same thing. There, in that center, in that calm, tranquil, connected place, there stand the saints of the ages, their hearts open to view. And lo, their hearts are our heart, and their hearts are the heart of the Eternal One, there is no separation. There is joining. That's how you know. That's how you know you're there. It's peaceful. 
It's not a separate from, it's a joined with. In awful solemnity, the Holy One is over all and in all, exquisitely loving, infinitely patient, tenderly smiling. Marks of glory are upon all things, and the marks are cruciform and blood-stained. It's real. The blood is there. You know, you go to a good 12-step meeting, you're, you're talking to somebody who's been through hell uh, in, in their recovery. They're, they're bloodied, but they're at peace. It's, it's, it's not that, you know, we've, we've got harps and wings and all that crap. No, no, we're, we're blood-stained. But there's joy. There's joy. And one sighs. Like the convinced Thomas of old, my Lord and my God, put his hands. Had you know, Thomas, non-believer, put it. You know, put your hands here, Thomas. Here, here are the wounds. Put them in. You know, we're all Thomases. We all need. We all need to come to this place. And you're going to get to this place through pain and blood and sweat and tears. At least that's the way most of us uh, in recovery get there, hey. Eh? I want to get to this. One emerges from such soul-shaking, love-invaded times into more normal states of consciousness. How long does it last? How long can you be in that center and remain there? And what Kelly is saying is, it ain't going to last. It isn't going to last. But one knows ever after that the eternal lover of the world, the hound of heaven, is utterly, utterly real, and that life must henceforth be forever determined by that real. Like St. Augustine, one asks not for greater certainty of God, but only for more steadfastness in him. There, beyond, in him, is the true center, and we are reduced, as it were, to nothing, for he is all. What's going to happen when I'm in touch with this center is the ego is going to shrink down to its proper size, verging on nothing. Now, I don't know if that nothing is total. I, th I think it, perhaps it is for a while. Maybe you could say it's transparent that the light within can now shine through because there's nothing blocking it. The egotism is not there blocking it. It's transparent, translucent. The light comes shining through. It's, it's as if I am nothing. I hope that makes, makes some sense to you. But it doesn't last. It can't last. It's not intended to last. In the early days, we used to call them bliss ninnies. People who thought they were constantly there. Oh, God, they were an annoying bunch. They just thought they had light coming out their ears and nostrils and everywhere you looked until you went home with them. <laughs> and then you found out, you know, there's a little darkness in there too. You know? So, I mean, all of the saints tell to say, say the same thing, you know. You can have one of these experiences. They're really nice. Wilson had it, like, like I said. You know, Dr. Bob uh, said he never had it. One could make the case, uh, Wilson uh, seemed to make it himself, that, that Bob was the holier guy, that through constant work and awakening and, and slower, you can, you, can, you can come to the same place. It, it's slower, it's gradual, it's, it's what the book talks about as the educational variety of spiritual experiences, um, and they're just as valid, and perhaps more so. But you can get you, you can get knocked on the ground too, and, and and a number of people come into the program that way. But the point is, realize it's not going to last. It's not going to last, you know, and that's not a bad thing. We are 
body and soul. You know, the soul gets on fire. Um, well, it's got to get back in the body. We trudge that road of happy destiny. Grateful for the experience because you're going to be totally changed as a result of that. I shouldn't say totally changed. You're going to, this is exactly what he said. You're going to remember that that's what's important. You know, and Wilson wanted to do LSD experiments later in his in his sobriety. Why? Because he thought that if people could have an encounter with the divine, if the, the veil could be lifted, they would know that there is a greater reality within, and that might help them get the program. Okay, this is the part I really want to get to. But in contrast, so, so this is the distinction, in contrast to this passive route where God acts on us, to complete obedience, most people follow what somebody calls the active way, wherein we must struggle and, like Job of old, wrestle with the angel until the morning dawns. The active way wherein the will, turn our life and our will, wherein the will must be subjected bit by bit piecemeal and progressively to the divine will. One of the guys told me this in early sobriety. God, it took me years to figure out what the hell he was talking about. The purpose of the will is to be willing. I don't think you can say it any more succinctly than that. The purpose of the human will is to align itself with the divine will. Not my will, but thy will be done. That's coming from that place. All right. So now he's going to talk about how do you get through those stages? It it was almost like if he's talking about the steps, how do you take the steps? Because that's what the steps are intended to do, to lead us through the process of removing enough ego I mean, steps, what, four through nine, totally about about removing the blockages to this divine presence. You know, one, two, three, we make a connection with this divine presence, may not understand it, uh, may not even have an experience of it, but we hitch our wagon to it, right? And then four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, we clear out all the blockages to it, and then 10, 11, and 12, we live with it and through it and in it. And it's a progressive deal and it goes on for years. Here's the four stages. Uh, I like it when people kind of break things down. Here's four parts. You, you can kind of wrap your ma- ra- mind around this. And, uh, and, and I think it's some really good stuff. The first step. This is the first step to the obedience of the second half. So... The first, <laughs> a lot of numbers. There. The first step to living a fully surrendered life, you know, going all the way, all right, is the flaming vision of the wonder of such a life, a vision which comes occasionally to us all through biographies of the saints, through a life lived before our eyes, through a haunting version of the Psalms through meditation on the amazing life of Jesus, he says in his case, through a flood of illumination or a great opening. But whatever the earthly history of this moment of charm, this vision of an absolutely holy life is, I am convinced, hang on to this, the invading, urging, inviting, persuading work of the eternal one. It's not that I've reached the mountaintop. It's that the mountaintop reached down and touched me. You know, enough of me got out of the way that it could enter. You know, and when does this usually happen to most of us? When the pain gets unbelievably harsh, tough, bottom. It's when it happens. That ego is knocked down. Now, does it have to happen that way? They, they say not. I love Rohr's, Rohr's remark. Two things powerful enough to change a person. Pain and prayer. 
Most people choose pain. That's what he says. No, that's where we are. It is curious. This is fascinating. It is curious that modern psychology cannot account wholly for flashes of insight of any kind, sacred or secular. It is as if a fountain of creative mind, capital M, were welling up, bubbling to expression within prepared spirits. There is an infinite fountain of lifting power pressing within us, luring us by dazzling visions, and we can only say the creative God comes into our souls. An increment of infinity is about us. Holy is imagination. H-O-L-Y. Holy is imagination. The gateway of reality into our hearts. The hound of heaven is on our track. The God of love is wooing us to his holy life. You know, okay, how do I get, how do I get to this thing? How do I get to, you know, this uh, spiritual experience, the, the, the long, hard way that most of us are traveling? Have a vision. Have a vision. Keep that vision. Did you ever see anybody who's got what you want? And now am I willing to go to any length to get what they have? You know, I saw people like that in my life. I saw people who uh, had been way the hell down and they came back up. Teach me how to do it. Show me the way. That's, that's what you want to get to. Not somebody who's going to throw the, the Bible at you or even the big book at you, you know, but somebody who's going who's to say, let, let me try to let you into my life. Let me try to tell you what was going on inside of me. And let me tell you what happened. What happened? You know, maybe I thought I was going crazy at the time. That's somebody you're going to get close to. Well, I hope you find somebody like that. <laughs> they're, they're out there. They're out there. They're in the program. You know, they're in the church. There's not many in either. But you got to find them. We have to find them. And, and, and that's the vision, you know, that, that, that we hold on to. That's the first step. Once having the vision, the second step to holy obedience is this. Very important. Begin where you are. Obey now. Begin where you are. Start to obey now. Uh, I didn't realize the, tr the power of this, but I've, I've said it in, in, in AA talks and things. The only thing I knew about God's will when I got sober, two things, and this is beginning where you are. I knew it was God's will that I not drink. <laughs> as crazy as I was, I could not convince myself God's will for me is to go take a drink. It's not God's will. And the second thing was don't run. Don't run away. Stay through the pain. Don't drink. Don't run. Begin where you are. That's where I was. I wasn't drinking and I wasn't running. There really wasn't much of me there. <laughs> but what there was, what there was, there I was, you know. And, and that's how you start. Obey. Obey now. Use what little obedience you are capable of, even if it be like a grain of mustard seed. Begin where you are. Live this present moment, this present hour, as you now Sit in your seats in utter, utter submission and openness towards him, God. Listen outwardly to these words, but within, behind the scenes, in the deeper levels of your lives where you are all alone with God, the loving eternal one, keep up a silent prayer. Some examples. Open my life to you. Guide my thoughts where I dare not let them go. Thy will be done, not mine. Walk on the streets and chat with your friends, but every moment behind the scene, be in prayer, offering yourselves in continuous obedience. I find this internal, continuous prayer life absolutely essential. It can be carried on day and night in the thick of business, in home and school. Such prayer of submission can be so simple. It is well to use a single sentence repeated over and over, uh, such as this, Be thou my will, be thou my will. I open all before thee. Thy will not mine be done. 
right? God, grant me the serenity. Help me accept the things I cannot change. Whatever, whatever your little mantra might be, find one, use it. Pull your mind back when it starts drifting and, uh, and going down dangerous uh, side streets there. First step is the vision. Hold the vision. Second step, begin where you are. Third step in holy obedience is this. If you slip and stumble and forget God for an hour and assert your old proud self and rely upon your old clever wisdom, don't spend too much time in anguished regrets and self-accusations, but begin again just where you are. Hang on to that one. It's really important. <laughs> you're going to lose it. Uh, you're going to fall asleep again. You had a great, you had an awakening, all right? In the vision, you had an awakening, all right? You're going to fall asleep again. When you catch yourself having fallen asleep again, and you will again and again and again, begin again, begin again. It's the best advice you'll ever get from any, any, any spiritual advisor. Here it is. And the fourth consideration in holy obedience is this. Don't grit your teeth and clench your fists and say, I will, I will. Instead, relax. Take hands off. Doesn't say it, but let go and let God. Submit yourself to God. Learn to live in the passive voice. A hard saying for Americans and let life be willed through you. For I will spells not obedience. Oh, I'm going to come at this thing with renewed vigor. I'm going to come at this thing and I'm going to do what I couldn't do yesterday or I couldn't do an hour ago. I'm going to do it. Listen to that. I'm, I'm, I'm. Nothing, that's not going to get you there. This is the fourth step on the, on the way. Don't grit your teeth and say, I will, I will. Let it come to you. I failed, I failed, I failed. Let that sink in. And, and let, let, <laughs> let God speak to you in that moment. All right, I'm doing two-way prayer for what? 32 years or such, eh? And, and the most fascinating thing is, and I fail a lot. Okay, I fail a lot. I fall asleep a lot. Going back to my two-way prayer, in 32 years, I have never been yelled at. I had ne I've never heard God say to me, well, you dumb idiot, you unfaithful servant. Never, never, never. What do I hear? Are you ready now? Are you more willing now? Again, the impetus, the power is not going to come from me. It's not going to come from your ego. It's all going to come from God. And, and that's what makes us grateful for our recoveries. If it's something that you do or something that I do, we're going to look at it and say, you know, I could have done that better. I could have done it differently. There's ego sink, slipping right back in. All right? But if it's a gift, if the power is not coming from me, but from, from a divine source, if lack of power is truly our dilemma, but there is one who has all power, that one is God. May you find him now. Good stuff, I hope. I'm going to read it again. I'm, I'm going to keep letting, letting this thing sink in. Um, th this chapter on um, uh, holy obedience uh, is it, just filled with so much more stuff than I had uh, thought was going to be there. So uh, I hope we're not stuck <laughs> in, the, in, this, uh, in, in this vein here. I uh, hope, hope some good stuff is, is coming to you uh, from these writings. Go get the book. You can get a secondhand copy pretty cheap. They're all over the place. A Testament of Devotion, Thomas R. Kelly. I hope this was helpful. If, if it was, tell a friend. Uh, if it wasn't, uh, don't tell a friend. So uh, <laughs> we don't want to scare anybody away. So they, they might need something something else that, that comes along down the track. Uh, anyway, 
Uh, thanks for listening, guys. Uh, hope, hope it helped you. God bless. Keep coming back.